right? And Tristan Harris, right, who was the, the gentleman who made the social dilemma with a bunch of other people, is struggling to articulate, but they can't quite get there. And the reason they can't get there is because there's this fundamental failure of first values and first principles. I want to I want to invite you to a particular book, right? It's called Surveillance Capitalism. It's written by Shoshana Zuboff. It's actually a great work. It's it's long, right? It's very very involved. It's not an easy read, but what it's about is is the inner structure of the nervous system of the planet today. And the nervous system of the planet is the web, right? Is the worldwide virtual world. Now, everyone who's listening now, I assume, has used Google. Is that fair? Has used Google? Has used Facebook, perhaps? Has used WhatsApp? Has used multiple applications all over the web? Has used Microsoft? Perhaps has used Verizon? Has used Amazon? Right? These are all normal applications that we use. What we're unaware of is that actually, as Zuboff points out, points out you know, very, very, very intensely, right? Tracking original documents from the year 2000 until today. Now let's just stay really close with me, stay really close. What is Google really doing? So what happens is you do a Google search, but when you do a Google search, what you search, how you searched, how you put in the query, that's all information. In fact, what Google is doing is Google has actually created a crawling of the web over an unimaginable amount of websites around the world. And every time you put information in the web, every time you write an email, so let's say you write a Gmail, Google is reading your mail and drawing information from your mail. Every time you send a picture, every time you send a text, right? How many question marks did you use? How did you space? Did you make mistakes? Every piece of information, how long your mouse hovers over a particular, how quickly you make a decision. What's actually happening is your entire set of preferences, but implied from what you did, not what you said, your personality, your emotions, right, are actually being fed into every information you ever write. It doesn't disappear. It's being fed into an extremely beyond imagination complex artificial intelligence system driven by machine intelligence in order to build a profile of you, in order to then be able to manipulate you through predictive analysis in order to either sell you or control you in a particular way. So for example, Google's business model is not organizing the world's information. And right? organizing the world's information is what Google began with. It was a public presentation. But when Google was pressured in 2000, by the dot-com explosion, right? The bubble burst and Google was pressed very hard by the venture capital funds that had invested in Silicon Valley. Google shifted its operation gradually and became essentially what Zuboff, she coined the term, a surveillance capitalist, which means you're being surveilled all the time. Information about you is poured into a machine intelligence driven exponential AI supercomputer of the kind that's able to infer from every jot and tittle that you write, your mood, your interior states, your preferences. An entire personality profile is built around you. And then you start receiving targeted ads. Your emails are all read. Every email you write, you write on a Google platform. All of the information in Facebook, everything that you put into Facebook, this is not Facebook creating a platform to interconnect the world. That's not Facebook's business model, that's a lie. Facebook's business model is taking all the information that you, all the attention of yours that's been hijacked into Facebook and, and then downloading it into a machine intelligence, artificial intelligent system, and then targeting you with ads. 
Now, those ads can be economic, but those ads can also be about health, and those ads can also be about how you vote. Now, stay with me closely. All of democracy is built on the voter and the consumer. The free movement of economy and the free movement of governance right, is the innovation of democracy, which took reality literally, right? Literally, it took when Homo sapien first appeared about 100,000 years ago, it took 100,000 years till we got to Homo sapien from matter to life to mind, self reflective mind of depth. And then to get, it took 100,000 years of Homo sapien. And really, the last, the last several hundred years, we finally got, right, to this first this huge innovation, this great evolution of consciousness, this great evolution of love, which is freedom, universal human rights. And universal human rights means that your will is sacrosanct, that you have the ability to collate information and make free decisions, that you own your future, that your will right, is, has sacred integrity, that you're an irreducibly unique person with irreducibly unique value. All of that are first principles and first values. And all of that is completely ignored by Google, Facebook, WhatsApp, Verizon, Microsoft, Amazon. That is to say the entire Plex. The entire Plex basically assumes that your experience, your interiority, your interior experience is raw material to be stolen, then subject to analysis, out of which emerges predictive analysis and then sold to advertisers. And advertisers could be political parties. Advertisers could be sellers of all sorts of information, right? To manipulate you, move you to buy or vote in a particular direction. However, you're unaware that all of that's happening. And that's, that's what's so unique. Imagine that you're Casper of playing chess in the famous deep blue match and you're against artificial intelligence the artificial intelligence wipes you out but the artificial intelligence that beat kasparov 30 years ago is now completely outdated and when google alpha pro played stockfish which represented that old artificial intelligence google alpha pro essentially decimated the old artificial intelligence so there's this new level of machine learning driven artificial intelligence that's actually exponentially more advanced than what beat the greatest reigning grand chess master 30 years ago. All of that is aligned secretly, hidden from you against your ability to make a free decision. So what happens to your integrity as a voter? It becomes a joke. What happens to your integrity as a consumer? It becomes a joke. So what happens to a free economy and free markets? What happens to a free democracy? It becomes a joke. You begin to get that, right? It's actually not in the social dilemma. The social dilemma is talking about, and the person who did the social dilemma met with us, right, at the center several times. But the social dilemma, right, is, and someone mentioned just now in the chat box, this is in the social dilemma. The social dilemma is quite a good documentary. The person who made the documentary met with some people at the center, one particular person over the last year, and they had some great conversations. The social dilemma focuses on social media. The focus is on social media with a, a kind of small conversation, right, around the larger issues. And The Social Dilemma, which is a great documentary, shares actually the same problem that Zuboff's book shares. And the problem is The Social Dilemma points out that the attention economy, social media, which is not what I focused on now, right, but it focuses on social media, that social media actually is hijacking your attention. And the social dilemma says, and that's terrible because they're not sure why. They don't quite tell you why is it terrible that they're hijacking your attention. Aren't they just being like normal advertisers? The social dilemma movie can't quite solve that. So the social dilemma says the reason is because then it creates polarization. You get into a particular bubble right, of information and you keep seeing your own political views reinforced right, and exaggerated. So it creates great polarization. That is in part true. That is in part true, but that's not the core. Both The Social Dilemma and Zuboff's book miss the core of the whole thing. And they're struggling to get it. They want to get it. They're on the edge, but they can't quite articulate it. And what? Can, and, and by the way, Shoshana Zuboff, the author of, this, of Surveillance Capitalism, appears in the documentary Social Dilemma. 
and, and she's struggling to articulate it, right? And Tristan Harris, right, who was the, the gentleman who made the social dilemma with a bunch of other people is struggling to articulate, but they can't quite get there. And the reason they can't get there is because there's this fundamental failure of first values and first principles. So Shoshana Zuboff is outraged that this is happening, but can't quite understand why it's so wrong. Because Shoshana Zuboff refuses to articulate any sense, right, of an evolving parentalism, not the old parentalism, but an evolving parentalism, an evolving natural law, or what we might call shared first values and first principles. So she understands there's this big violation here, but what's it a violation of? And so you read the book and you get the outrage, you get what's happening, but you're not quite sure why. The same thing with the social dilemma, right? There's this outrage, they're stealing my attention, but, but big deal, right? Advertisers always steal attention, that's what it's about. Why is that new, right? There, there's not an understanding, right, of first principles and first values. And first principles and first values means that my interior experience is irreducibly unique. That feeling that experience is my source of wisdom, that my attention and my unique quality of attention is my irreducible quality of the sacred, and that it's my attention that blooms reality. It's my attention that's creative, that my ability to access my deepest quality of feeling reality is blocked, that actually no one has a right to access my interior experience and then sell it to someone who's not me without my permission, whose interests aren't aligned with mine. So actually, you can't understand the violation without a deep articulation of unique self, which is one of our first principles and first values. And we'll talk in our next installment three in much more depth. I had intended to do it today, but we went too long. We'll talk about six or seven examples of first principles and first values. But without first principles and first values, you can't move. I'm gonna read you to, to move towards a close. I'm gonna read you, right, six declarations of Google, which are now no longer published by Google, but they were found by Zuboff in an early set of Google documents. And I want you to, to get this. See, when Google goes to take human experience, this was not their original intention. They actually created a search engine. And then they realized that in the exhaust, if you will, of the search engine, there was an enormous amount of surplus data. And then as the dot-com bubble burst, they were attacked right, by their own entrepreneurs and they needed to figure out how not to close. Since Bryn and Page, Sergey Bryn and Larry Page, Stanford educated postmodernists with no sense of first principles and first values. So their metrics was, as Bryn says, I didn't want to feel like a schmuck. I didn't want my Silicon Valley place to close. I was in a success story governed by win-lose metrics. I can't close. So they realized, oh, oh, wow. Amir Patel was the particular person who really understood it. And he worked closely with Eric Schmidt a little later, a couple of years later. And they developed an entire model in which since it wasn't governed by law because it was an unprecedented reality, this computation structure had never existed before. Google said, there's no law governing this. This is the wild west as they would say in America, right? No one's gonna stop us because no one's thought of it. We're gonna basically steal your personal experience without your permission. And that's the core model of Facebook, Google again, Intel, right? Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft, in different ways, they're all doing the same thing. Their business model is surveillance capitalism. Okay, so here's the declarations, okay? I want you to get the declarations. And they're actually kind of shocking. Six declarations. One, and I'm quoting directly, we claim human experience as raw material for the taking. I mean, did you get the insanity of that? On the basis of this claim, so get this again, we claim human experience as raw material for the taking. On the basis of this claim, we can ignore considerations of individuals' rights, interests, awareness, or comprehension. Right? Wow. So, for example, you sign a waiver whenever you get a new app. It says agree or disagree. And there's this long contract that would take you two hours to read that no one ever reads. 
right, which bypasses genuine consent, which you agree to unbelievable things. What you're agreeing is to actually have all your material stolen and then sold to third parties. But you don't even know what you're reading. People, the average people take 14 seconds, according to one study, right, to actually read right, those, those contracts, which aren't really contracts. They're uncontracts, as Zuboff calls them. They're violations of the notion of contract. So I'm going to read these through right now. Here we go. One, we claim human experience as raw material free for the taking. On the basis of this claim, we can ignore considerations of individuals' rights, interests, awareness, and comprehension. That's one. Two, on the basis of our claim, we assert the right to take an individual's experience. On the basis of our claim, we assert the right to take an individual's experience for translation into behavioral data, right? Meaning everything you did, every hovering of a mouse, right? Every exclamation point, every question mark, all of that is fed into this AI monstrosity, which then using machine learning translates your experience into a new shadow script. It's a shadow script that's only readable by the new priesthood. And the new priesthood are the people that can read this new text. And this new text is readable only through this machine intelligence that then reads the text, then conducts Chinese auctions, millions, billions a second, selling your information in order to target you for some version of manipulation unbeknownst to you that violates your will. Okay, three, a right to take based on our claim of free mom material confers the right to own the behavioral daughter, confers the right to own the behavioral, excuse me, data derived from human experience. I wanna read that again, it's so shocking. A right to take based on our claim of free raw material confers the right to own the behavioral data derived from human experience. Four, our right to take and to own confer rights to know what the data discloses. I'm gonna read it again because it's, it's beyond shocking. We have a right to take the data. We have, a right to, we have a right to take your experience. We have a right to turn it into data. We have a right to own your data and we have a right to know what the data discloses. So the personality profile, which is generated by machine intelligence right, mediated, right, the engine of artificial intelligence, which you're unaware is happening, then builds a profile to manipulate you. We own that. We have a right to know all of this about you, even though you didn't give us permission. Why? Just because. We're just claiming it. It's, it's a completely, completely made up claim. And the only way you can make up a claim like this with such vicious audacity is if you have no first principles you have no first values. If there's no first principles and first values, well, then there is no irreducible unique self, right? There is no homo amor, right? There is no love as a first principle. There is no your interior quality that needs to be honored, right? And supported. I'm not responsible for the emergence of a unique self symphony, right? None of that's true. All of that is, doesn't exist. It's just a social construction of reality after all says Larry Page and Sergey Brin and Mark Zuckerberg, right? And, and a host of others. And, and the tens of thousands of the best scientists who've been absorbed into the webplex drain. See, we need our best minds and our best scientists to solve existential risk and catastrophic risk. Our best interior scientists Right, who are articulating first values and first principles, and our best exterior scientists who can develop external solutions, exterior and exterior need to move together. But actually what's happening today, the best scientists are being absorbed because they're being paid enormous salaries. Each one of them, each one of these scientists and their families are in a success story win-lose metrics. So we're actually draining the best minds in the world in order to develop the best way to get more and more surplus behavioral data. These are behavioral futures about you that are sold against your interest. All of this is happening all the time. And you think that you're being benefited with these really sweet, right? Different apps and 
Google and Facebook that are really lovely and you're just on them and they're just very lovely and they're free and they give you a sense of empowerment. So basically, the world of the web is playing to your need for empowerment and may serve you in all sorts of ways. It's not that Facebook doesn't do many good things and Google doesn't do many good things. Of course they do. But those good things are a mask for this deeper dystopia. And imagine when we go from, and stay with me close, we go from holdables, you hold your phone, right? You hold your computer, you're downloading data. You go to wearables, which is Bluetooth or Google glasses, right? To, right? And, and all sorts of genes that are being made today and what's called the internet of things, right? We're actually developing more and more what's called the internet of things, which means that actually all of the world will become a virtual web. Why do you think there's Google Earth? Why do you think there's Google FaceTime view? Right? These are all taking pictures of all domains of experience and feeding it into the Google Plex, the Facebook Plex, right? the Oracle Plex, the Microsoft Plex monster. But that's actually what's happening. And so what's basically happening is, now imagine, let me, let me split that sentence. Let me cut that sentence off. Imagine the third level, biometric sensors. You have under the skin sensors and we're very close to that. And the reason people are gonna use them is because they can predict cancer in 30 years. See, all these things have good uses, right? Your health can be better served by biometric sensors. So biometric sensors, which are already being, beginning to be used around the world, meaning an under the skin chip in order to give you the best health in the world and for you to be part of the grid and because if you're not part of the grid, you don't exist in order to get a job, in order to, to get insurance. So by that point, you've got holdables, your phone, your computer, wearables, right? Bluetooth, your Google glasses, and all sorts of other structures that are going to actually become part of what's called the internet of things, right? It's kind of the, it's the clothing of your life, whether it's a thermostat right, in your house, whether it's a bed, right? It's a smartphone and smart bed and smart thermostat. Right? and a Google Assistant, a digital assistant. And you get the move. Right? It's a move to appeal to people to empower them. We're going to give you what the rich people have. The rich people have digital assistants. Now you're going to have a digital assistant. Isn't that great? But your digital assistant, just like your thermostat and a smart thermostat, and just like your bed and a smart bed, are actually gathering data about everything happening and feeding that data right, into the system. Now, you can say, well, there's a place you could actually deny the data. Right? There's a place you can say no and not agree to share your data. However, if you read the contract carefully, it says that if you don't agree to share the data, then most of the good features that make the system run well are not guaranteed or will be shut down. It's a little blackmail in the system, right? People spend 14 seconds reading the contract. And if you read the contract and you say no, actually, the the functioning of what you've bought actually won't work. Wow. It's like, now here's the last two, the last two of Google's declarations. Our rights to take, to own, and to know confer the right to decide how we use the knowledge. And finally, our right to take, to own, to know, and to decide confer our right to the conditions that preserve our rights to take, to own, to know, and decide, which means it's our decision how to use the knowledge. And then it's our right to do everything that we can, right, to fight any law or any change in the status quo, which would challenge our right to own your interior experience. Wow, does everyone get this? Does everyone get this? Now, the only reason this is possible, and this is what the social dilemma missed, and it's what Shoshana Zuboff missed, and they're both great works, and they did a good job. But without a sense of unique self, without an, a sense of the value of interiority, without the unique value of your interior unique experience, right? without a sense of first values and principles of cosmos, which means that cosmos, for example, is evolution. And evolution is growth and transformation. And the purpose of my life is to actually go through a unique trajectory of my own unique growth and transformation. And in order to go through my unique growth and transformation, I need to place my in attention on my interiority in order to facilitate my own deepest growth and transformation, which is my greatest joy, which allows me to give my unique gift and live my unique life. Those are all first values and first principles. They're not dogmas. We've spent the last 10 years at the Center for Integral Wisdom working on articulating 
Okay. The best vision of these first values and first principles, and we're going to spend the next five, six years writing this into a great library. And it has to be as perfect as it can be. But without these first principles and first values, Shoshana Zuboff, right? And I'm reading her intensely because she's necessary reading, but her rage is sputtering. You get the word sputtering? I mean, sputtering means she can't quite express it. Right? She cites Auden, the poet, in order to express her rage, but that doesn't take you home. And every time she tries to express what values are they violating, she comes up with some kind of general, very insipid, broad sentences that actually fall way short of first principles and first values. So she's outraged, but she, since essentially she's a postmodernist, at least that's how she presents publicly, she has no way to articulate the rage. Tristan Harris, who's a lovely young man, I don't know him, he's worked with some people at the center, right, and not with one of my colleagues, right, and, and certainly a lovely young man, but no articulate sense, right? And he did a great job in The Social Dilemma, as did the people that worked with him, but no articulate sense of first values and first principles that are being violated, right? Unless you get that your attention and your unique quality of attention is part of the irreducible structure of your unique self, that your unique self is not your separate self. And it's not a social construction of reality, right? And it's not your Myers-Briggs test. It's an irreducibly unique quality of desire, of appetite, of intimacy. And unless you validate that, and you validate uniqueness as a first principle of cosmos. And you validate the evolution of uniqueness as unique self. That's a whole job. We wrote an entire book, Unique Self, as the first step at doing that. Without having that depth of, of knowing, there's no way you can object. And so Shoshana Zuboff, that's the tragedy, falls short. She sputters. And the social dilemma in the end, right? And that's what it was critiqued for, sputters. Right? It's, it's going in the right direction, but where? Where? Did you get that, friends? Did you get that? It's a big deal, right? Right? So in other words, what we've done is, what we've done is, and what I tried to do in this presentation, right, is, is number one, to expose, right, to, to make clear, to make visible, right, the, the actual inner structure in which human experience is stolen. Colonized is too nice of a word. It's outright robbery, which is what a lot of colonization was, but I want to just call it robbery. It's an original sin. It's outright violation, right? It's a fundamental rape of an individual's interiority, but it's rape even without their knowledge, right? And it's selling of that interiority in a way that's misaligned with that person's essential interest. Now it's taken me last decade Right, to be able to articulate this clearly, right? And we're going to spend, right, right, the next years, right, writing about this, this year and next year and the year after. And we're writing an entire volume on this particular dimension. And I hope for a lot of people, once you hear this, it's like, wow, kind of knew that all along. That's the nature of a great insight, right? You can act it's like, it's, now it's obvious and it's beautiful. It's like, wow. And it's beautiful in that it's obvious. But what we need to do is, right, and that's what we've called for the last five years, the reconstructive project. Right? And the reconstructive project is to reconstruct first principles and first values that will actually understand the violation. And then we can then be activated against the violation. And here's the last point. And I want to just play off the word activated. You have to have a first person experience of your value. You have to be activated. Right? So one of the first principles and first values of cosmos is what we want to call activation. And activation you can, all, you can call it transformation. In some of the mystical traditions, they called it ascension. In other, ones, in other traditions, they called it the great descent. But really, what it means is, is that you actually access directly an experience of reality, infinite value lived as you. You actually transcend the limited identity of ego. You don't leave ego behind. You don't leave your separate self behind. Of course you don't. But you realize you evolve beyond exclusive identification with ego and you actually come alive right, to your own inner nature. You watch Ode to Joy right, in the square in Italy, right, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, and you're filled with this larger sense of yourself. You do profound meditation. You do ecstatic prayer. right? You dance. 
you do practices of writing outrageous love letters, but not as a writing practice, but writing in which you actually become the outrageous love. You realize that you're lived as love. You realize that you're lived as joy. You realize that actually infinity manifested you, finitude, as a unique expression of infinite value itself. You realize that you're infinitely needed and infinitely desired, infinitely honored, infinitely intended by cosmos, that you're both held by infinity and you participate in infinity itself. You have to have a direct first person experience. You can't have someone tell you that it's true unless they're telling you in a method that we call transmission. And my hope is that you can hear in my voice, right? The truth of it. And if any part of you recognizes, you don't have to work out the conceptual structure, just recognize, oh, you can feel the truth of that. that that's, that's the truth of that reality coming alive in you. It's a non-conceptual reality. It's the infinite value of you, not because you're a commodity and not because you're sold right to advertisers for a personalized ad or to manipulate your vote. No, you are irreducibly gorgeous. Your unique quality of intimacy, your unique quality of presence, your unique quality of joy, your unique story is celebrated and needed by all of cosmos. And you disclose to infinity a face of herself. So, so wow. So your story needs to be fully lived and fully told and your gift fully gived because that's what it means to be alive right in this world, right? The direct experience of that is what, and just with, with like total, like trembling humility, but I, I, I'd love for you to feel right in this moment. Can you feel that? Who can feel that? Can anyone feel that? Anybody who can feel it? If you can just give us a yes. If you can feel it, who can feel it? Right? Can you feel it? Anybody else? Can you feel it? Anybody else? Right? Can anybody else feel it? Yes. Right? Right? And let the ego go. Right? Let the ego go. Right? Let the, let the go. All right? Right? Just, just, right? Just give a, right? Just scream the yes. Right? Scream it. Right? Scream it. Right? Scream it. And people, right? Sometimes we can get stuck in our, I'm doing my work. I'm doing my right. Yes! 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 My integrity is in that yes. My integrity lives in that yes, friends. That's where my integrity lives. Right? Wow. So we can't just paint an intellectual picture, right? We can't just engage in practice. We have to be fully activated, fully alive. We have to become not homo sapien. We have to engage the transformation apotheosis, in which we literally participate in that infinite value. And we also have to stand against, stand against the sense that exists through, I've read in the last, you know, several years, in the last several weeks, particularly, I've read maybe a thousand documents, right? You know, intense documents from different court cases, early Google documents, Facebook documents. And the intensity of this is beyond imagination. We have to actually expose and deconstruct and obstruct and stop this m moment in history. We have to reshape it. And the argument against stopping it is it's inevitable, but it's not inevitable. It's only inevitable. It's only inevitable if there's no larger story. It's inevitable if Sergey Brin and Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page are driven by a success story governed by a win-lose metrics. Right? And if basically larger exponential profits right, of a very narrow sector, 1% of the population drive reality, it's inevitable but it's not inevitable in any other way. And it's time for revolution. It's time to stand, right? It's time to articulate policies and articulate a new direction. And over the next year, we're gonna be thinking about what the policy should be. But one of the possibilities is, and it's not yet formulated, is for people just to in mass get off social media. Like, wow, it's not yet an easy possibility. Social media has a lot of good to it. So how do we actually change social media? How do we change Facebook? How do we change Google? So the first activism where it's got to all begin is articulating first values and first principles, articulating the five keys, coming together, letting go of my own egoic ambition, 
and in stepping into a unique self-symphony and becoming a cascading force of spirit, of joy, of revolutionary joy, and of audacity, right? That becomes a revolution that changes the course of history. That's what we have to do now. We have to stand, we have to inhibit inevitability and articulate first values and first principles, which are the great revolution. Mm -hmm.